The Battle of Dien Bien Phu, Vietnamese, Chien Dic Dien Bien Phu, Ipa, was a climactic confrontation of the First Indochina War that took place between 13 March and 7 May 1954. It was fought between the French Union's colonial Far East Expeditionary Corps and Viet Minh Communist revolutionaries. The United States was officially not a party to the war, but it was secretly involved by providing financial and material aid, which included CIA-contracted American personnel participating in the battle. The French began an operation to insert, then support, their soldiers at Dien Bien Phu, deep in the west of Tonkin, up in the hills of northwestern Vietnam. The operation's purpose was to cut off Viet Minh supply lines into the neighboring kingdom of Laos, and draw the Viet Minh into a major confrontation in order to cripple them. The plan was to resupply the French position by air, based on the belief that the Viet Minh had no anti-aircraft capability. The Viet Minh, however, under General Vo Win Zop, surrounded and besieged the French. They brought in vast amounts of heavy artillery and managed to move these bulky weapons through difficult terrain up the rear slopes of the mountains. They then dug tunnels through the mountains and arranged the guns to target the French position. In March, a massive artillery bombardment by the Viet Minh ensued. The strategic positioning of their artillery made it nearly impervious to French counter-battery fire. Tenacious fighting on the ground ensued, reminiscent of the trench warfare of World War I. At times, the French repulsed Viet Minh assaults on their positions while supplies and reinforcements were delivered by air. As key positions were overrun, the perimeter contracted, and the air resupply on which the French had placed their hopes became impossible. As the Viet Minh anti-aircraft fire took its toll, fewer and fewer of those supplies reached the French. The garrison was overrun in May after a two-month siege, and most of the French forces surrendered. A few of them escaped to Laos. The French government in Paris then resigned, and the new Prime Minister, the left of centre Pierre Mendes France, supported French withdrawal from Indochina. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu was decisive, the war ended shortly afterward, and the 1954 Geneva Accords were signed. France agreed to withdraw its forces from all its colonies in French Indochina, while stipulating that Vietnam would be temporarily divided at the 17th parallel, with control of the North given to the Viet Minh as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, and the South becoming the state of Vietnam, nominally under Emperor Bao Dai, preventing Ho Chi Minh from gaining control of the entire country. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Military Situation By 1953, the First Indochina War was not going well for France. A succession of commanders, Philippe Leclerc de Haute-Cluck, Jean-Étienne Vallée, Roger Blazot, Marcel Carpentier, Jean de Lartre de Tassigny, and Raoul Salan, had proven incapable of suppressing the insurrection of the Viet Minh fighting for independence. During their 1952-1953 campaign, the Viet Minh had overrun vast swathes of Laos, Vietnam's western neighbor, advancing as far as Luong Prabang and the Plain of Jars. The French were unable to slow the advance of the Viet Minh, who fell back only after outrunning their always tenuous supply lines. In 1953, the French had begun to strengthen their defenses in the Hanoi Delta region to prepare for a series of offensives against Viet Minh staging areas in northwest Vietnam. They set up fortified towns and outposts in the area, including Le Chau near the Chinese border to the north, Na San to the west of Hanoi, and the Plain of Jars in northern Laos. In May 1953, French Premier Rene Meyer appointed Henri Navarre, a trusted colleague, to take command of French Union forces in Indochina. Meyer had given Navarre a single order, to create military conditions that would lead to an honorable political solution. According to military scholar Philip Davidson. On arrival, Navarre was shocked by what he found. There had been no long-range plan since Delatra's departure. Everything was conducted on a day-to-day, -day, reactive basis. Combat operations were undertaken only in response to enemy moves or threats. There was no comprehensive plan to develop the organization and build up the equipment of the expeditionary force. Finally, Navarre, 
the intellectual, the cold and professional soldier, was shocked by the school's out attitude of Salan and his senior commanders and staff officers. They were going home, not as victors or heroes, but then, not as clear losers either. To them the important thing was that they were getting out of Indochina with their reputations frayed, but intact. They spared little thought or concern for the problems of their successors. Chapter 1 Section 2 Na San and the Hedgehog Concept Navarre began searching for a way to stop the Viet Minh threat to Laos. Colonel Louis Bertail, commander of Mobile Group 7 and Navarre's main planner, formulated the Aerison concept. The French army would establish a fortified airhead by airlifting soldiers to positions adjacent to key Viet Minh supply lines to Laos. They would cut off Viet Minh soldiers fighting in Laos and force them to withdraw. It was an attempt to interdict the enemy's rear area, to stop the flow of supplies and reinforcements, to establish a readout in the enemy's rear and disrupt his lines. The hedgehog concept was based on French experiences at the Battle of Nha San. In late November and early December 1952, Zop had attacked the French outpost at Nha San, which was essentially an air land base, a fortified camp supplied only by air. The French had beaten back Zop's forces repeatedly, inflicting very heavy losses on them. The French hoped that by repeating the strategy on a much larger scale, they would be able to lure Zop into committing the bulk of his forces to a massed assault. This would enable superior French artillery, armor, and air support to decimate the exposed Viet Minh forces. The success at Nha San convinced Navarre of the viability of the fortified airhead concept, but French staff officers failed to treat seriously several crucial differences between Dien Bien Phu and Nha San. First, at Nha San, the French commanded most of the high ground with overwhelming artillery support. At Dien Bien Phu, however, the Viet Minh controlled much of the high ground around the valley, their artillery far exceeded French expectations, and they outnumbered the French troops four to one. Zop compared Dien Bien Phu to a rice bowl, where his troops occupied the edge and the French the bottom. Second, Zop made a mistake at Nha San by committing his forces to reckless frontal attacks before being fully prepared. He learned his lesson, at Dien Bien Phu, Zop spent months meticulously stockpiling ammunition, and in placing heavy artillery, and anti-aircraft guns before making his move. Teams of Viet Minh volunteers were sent into the French camp to scout the disposition of the French artillery. Artillery pieces were sighted within well-constructed and camouflaged casemates. As a result, when the battle finally began, the Viet Minh knew exactly where the French artillery pieces were, while the French did not even know how many guns Zop possessed. Third, the aerial resupply lines at Nha San were never severed, despite Viet Minh anti-aircraft fire. At Dien Bien Phu, Zop amassed anti-aircraft batteries that quickly shut down the runway, and made it extremely difficult and costly for the French to bring in reinforcements. Chapter 2, Prelude Chapter 2 Section 1, Lead Up to Castor In June 1953, Major General René Cogni, the French commander in the Tonkin Delta, proposed Dien Bien Phu, which had an old airstrip built by the Japanese during World War II, as a mooring point. In another misunderstanding, Cogni envisioned a likely defended point from which to launch raids, Navarre, however, believed that he intended to build a heavily fortified base capable of withstanding a siege. Navarre selected Dien Bien Phu for Bertail's hedgehog operation. When presented with the plan, Every major subordinate officer, Colonel Jean-Louis Nico, Cogni, and Generals Jean Gilles and Jean Dico, protested. Cogni pointed out, presciently, that we are running the risk of a new Narsan under worse conditions. Navarre rejected the criticisms of his proposal and concluded a 17 November conference by declaring that the operation would begin three days later. On 20 November 1953 Navarre decided to go ahead with the plan despite serious operational difficulties. These later became painfully obvious, but at the time may have been less apparent. He had been repeatedly assured by his intelligence officers that the operation carried very little risk of involvement by a strong enemy force. 
Navarre had previously considered three other approaches to defending Laos, mobile warfare, which was impossible given the terrain in Vietnam, a static defense line stretching to Laos, which was not feasible given the number of troops at Navarre's disposal, or placing troops in the Laotian provincial capitals and supplying them by air, which was unworkable due to the distance from Hanoi to Luang Prabang and Vientiane. Navarre believed that this left only the hedgehog option, which he characterized as a mediocre solution. The French National Defense Committee ultimately agreed that Navarre's responsibility did not include defending Laos. However, its decision, which was drawn up on 13 November, was not delivered to him until 4 December, two weeks after the Dien Bien Phu operation began. Chapter 2 Section 2 – Establishment of Air Operations Operations at Dien Bien Phu began at 10.35 on 20 November 1953. In Operation Castor, the French dropped or flew 9,000 troops into the area over three days, as well as a bulldozer to prepare the airstrip. They were landed at three drop zones, Natasha, Octavi, and Simone. The Viet Minh Elite 148th Independent Infantry Regiment, headquartered at Dien Bien Phu, reacted instantly and effectively. Three of its four battalions, however, were absent. Initial operations proceeded well for the French. By the end of November, six parachute battalions had been landed, and the French army consolidated its positions. One 2018 book refers to aerial supply that the French needed to fly in 36,000 tons of equipment, they managed 4,000 tons. It was at this time that Zop began his counter moves. He had expected an attack, but had not foreseen when or where it would occur. Zop realized that, if pressed, the French would abandon Le Chao province and fight a pitched battle at Dien Bien Phu. On 24 November, Zop ordered the 148th Infantry Regiment and the 316th Division to attack Le Chao, while the 308th, 312th, and 351st Divisions assaulted Dien Bien Phu from Viet Bac. Starting in December, the French, under the command of Colonel Christian de Castries, began transforming their anchoring point into a fortress by setting up seven satellite positions. The fortified headquarters was centrally located, with positions Huguet to the west, Claudine to the south, and Dominique to the northeast. The other positions were Anne-Marie to the northwest, Beatrice to the northeast, Gabrielle to the north, and Isabel six kilometers to the south, covering the reserve airstrip. The choice of de Castries as the local commander at Dien Bien Phu was, in retrospect, a bad one. Navarre chose de Castries, a cavalryman in the 18th century tradition, because Navarre envisioned Dien Bien Phu as a mobile battle. But Dien Bien Phu would require a commander adept at World War I style trench warfare, something for which de Castries was not suited. The arrival of the 316th Viet Minh Division prompted Cogni to order the evacuation of the Le Chao garrison to Dien Bien Phu, exactly as Zop had anticipated. En route, they were virtually annihilated by the Viet Minh. Of the 2,100 men who left Le Chao on 9 December, only 185 made it to Dien Bien Phu on the 22nd of December. The rest had been killed, captured, or deserted. The Viet Minh troops converged on Dien Bien Phu. French military forces had committed 10,800 troops, together with yet more reinforcements, totaling nearly 16,000 men, to the defense of a monsoon-affected valley surrounded by heavily wooded hills and high ground that had not been secured. Artillery as well as 10 USM-24 Chaffee light tanks and numerous aircraft were committed to the garrison. A number of quadruple 0.50 caliber machine guns were present and used in the ground roll. This included France's regular troops, French foreign legionnaires, Algerian and Moroccan Tirailers and locally recruited Indochinese infantry. In comparison, altogether the Viet Minh had moved up to 50,000 regular troops into the hills surrounding the French held valley, totaling five divisions, including the 351st Heavy Division, which was an artillery formation equipped with medium artillery, such as the USM 101 105mm howitzer, 
supplied by the neighboring People's Republic of China from captured stocks obtained from defeated nationalist China, as well as U.S. forces in Korea, together with some heavier field guns as well as anti-aircraft artillery. Various types of artillery and anti-aircraft guns, which outnumbered their French counterparts by about four to one, were moved into strategic positions overlooking the valley and the French forces based there. The French garrison came under sporadic direct artillery fire from the Viet Minh for the first time on 31 January 1954 and patrols encountered the Viet Minh troops in all directions around them. The French were completely surrounded. Chapter 2 Section 3, Zop's Change of Strategy Originally, the planned Viet Minh attack was based on the Chinese fast strike, fast victory model, which aimed to use all available power to thrust into the command center of the base to secure victory, but this was changed to the steady fight, steady advance model of siege tactics. The battle plan designed on the fast strike model was due to open at 5 p.m. on 25 January, and to finish three nights and two days later. Nevertheless this start date was delayed to 26 January, because on 21 January Viet Minh's intelligence indicated that the French had grasped this plan. After much debate, due to the French knowledge of the battle plan and along with other complications, the assault was cancelled on 26 January, and Zop went away and designed a new plan with a new start time. He said that this change of plan was the hardest decision of his military career. Chapter 3, Rattle. Chapter 3 Section 1, Beatrice. The Viet Minh assault began in earnest on 13 March 1954 with an attack on the northeastern outpost, Beatrice, which was held by the 3rd Battalion, 13th Foreign Legion Demi Brigade. Viet Minh artillery opened a fierce bombardment with two batteries each of 105 mm howitzers, 120 mm mortars, and 75mm mountain guns. French command was disrupted at 18.30 when a shell hit the French command post, killing the battalion commander, Major Paul Peggott, and most of his staff. A few minutes later, Lieutenant Colonel Jules Goucher, commander of the entire central subsector, was also killed by artillery fire. The Viet Minh 312th Division then launched an assault with its 141st and 209th Infantry Regiments, using sappers to breach the French obstacles. Beatrice comprised three separate strong points forming a triangle with the point facing north. In the southeast, strong point Beatrice 3, its defenses smashed by 75mm mountain guns firing at point-blank range, was quickly overrun by the 209th Regiment's 130th Battalion. In the north, most of Beatrice 1 was swiftly conquered by the 141st Regiment's 428th Battalion, but the defenders held out in corner of the position for a time because the attackers thought they had captured the entire strong point when they encountered an internal barbed wire barrier in the dark. In the southwest, the assault on Beatrice II by the 141st Regiment's 11th Battalion did not fare well because its assault trenches were too shallow and portions of them had been flattened by French artillery. Its efforts to breach Beatrice II's barbed wire were stalled for hours by flanking fire from Beatrice I and several previously undetected bunkers on Beatrice II that had been spared by the bombardment. The holdouts on Beatrice I were eliminated by 2230 and the 141st Regiment's 11th and 16th Battalions finally broke into Beatrice two an hour later, though the strong point was not entirely taken until after one o'clock on 14 March. Roughly 350 French Legionnaires were killed, wounded, or captured. About 100 managed to escape and rejoin the French lines. The French estimated that Viet Minh losses totaled 600 dead and 1,200 wounded. The victory at Beatrice galvanized the morale of the Viet Minh troops. On the following morning, a truce of a few hours was agreed and the French were authorized to come to the captured position and evacuate their wounded and dead. Much to French disbelief, the Viet Minh had employed direct artillery fire, in which each gun crew does its own artillery spotting. Indirect artillery, generally held as being far superior to direct fire, requires experienced, well-trained crews and good communications, which the Viet Minh lacked. Navarre wrote that, 
Under the influence of Chinese advisors, the Viet Minh commanders had used processes quite different from the classic methods. The artillery had been dug in by single pieces, they were installed in shellproof dugouts, and fire point blank from portholes. This way of using artillery and A guns was possible only with the expansive ant holes at the disposal of the Viet Minh, and was to make shambles of all the estimates of our own artillerymen. Two days later, the French artillery commander, Colonel Charles Piroth, distraught at his inability to silence the well-camouflaged Viet Minh batteries, went into his dugout and committed suicide with a hand grenade. He was buried there in secret to prevent loss of morale among the French troops. Chapter 3 Section 2 Gabriel Following a five-hour ceasefire on the morning of 14 March, Viet Minh artillery resumed pounding French positions. The airstrip, already closed since 1600 hours the day before due to a light bombardment, was now put permanently out of commission. Any further French supplies would have to be delivered by parachute. That night, the Viet Minh launched an attack on the northern outpost Gabriel, held by an elite Algerian battalion. The attack began with a concentrated artillery barrage at 1700 hours. This was very effective and stunned the defenders. Two regiments from the crack 308th Division attacked starting at 2000 hours. At four o'clock the following morning, an artillery shell hit the battalion headquarters, severely wounding the battalion commander and most of his staff. Dr. Castries ordered a counterattack to relieve Gabriel. However, Colonel Pierre Longley, informing the counterattack, chose to rely on the 5th Vietnamese Parachute Battalion, which had jumped in the day before and was exhausted. Although some elements of the counterattack reached Gabriel, most were paralyzed by Viet Minh artillery and took heavy losses. At eight o'clock the next day, the Algerian battalion fell back, abandoning Gabriel to the Viet Minh. The French lost around 1,000 men defending Gabriel, and the Viet Minh between 1,000 and 2,000 attacking the strongpoint. Chapter 3 Section 3, Anne-Marie The northwestern outpost Anne-Marie was defended by Thai troops, members of an ethnic minority loyal to the French. For weeks, Zop had distributed subversive propaganda leaflets, telling the Thais that this was not their fight. The fall of Beatrice and Gabrielle had demoralized them. On the morning of 17 March, under the cover of fog, the bulk of the Thais left or defected. The French and the few remaining Thais on Anne-Marie were then forced to withdraw. Chapter 3 Section 4, Lull a lull in fighting occurred from the 17th of March to the 30th of March. The Viet Minh further tightened the noose around the French central area, effectively cutting off Isabel and its 1,809 personnel to the south. During this lull, the French suffered from a serious crisis of command. It had become painfully evident to the senior officers within the encircled garrison, and even to Cogni at Hanoi, that de Castries was incompetent to conduct the defense of Dean Bian Phu. Even more critical, after the fall of the northern outposts, he isolated himself in his bunker so that he had, in effect, relinquished his command authority. On the 17th of March, Cogni attempted to fly into Dean Bian Phu to take command, but his plane was driven off by anti-aircraft fire. Cogni considered parachuting into the encircled garrison, but his staff talked him out of it. The Castries' seclusion in his bunker, combined with his superior's inability to replace him, created a leadership vacuum in the French command. On 24 March, an event took place which later became a matter of historical debate. The historian Bernard Fall records, based on Longley memoirs, that Colonel Longley and his fellow paratroop commanders, all fully armed, confronted de Castries in his bunker on 24 March. They told him he would retain the appearance of command, but that Longley would exercise it. The Castries is said by Fall to have accepted the arrangement without protest, although he did exercise and command functions thereafter. Philip Davidson stated that the truth would seem to be that Longley did take over effective command of Dean Bian Phu, 
and their castries became commander emeritus who transmitted messages to Hanoi and offered advice about matters in Dean Bian Phu. Jules Roy, however, makes no mention of this event, and Martin Windrow argues that the paratrooper putsch is unlikely to have ever happened. Both historians record that Longley and Marcel Bigier were known to be on good terms with their commanding officer. French aerial resupply took heavy losses from Viet Minh machine guns near the landing strip. On 27 March, the Hanoi Air Transport Commander, Ni Ko, ordered that all supply deliveries be made from 2,000 meters or higher, losses were expected to remain heavy. The following day, the Castries ordered an attack against the Viet Minh A machine guns three kilometers west of Dien Bien Phu. Remarkably, the attack was a complete success, with 350 Viet Minh soldiers killed and 17 A machine guns destroyed, while the French lost, 20 killed and 97 wounded. Chapter 3 Section 5, The 30th March to the 5th April Assaults the next phase of the battle saw more massed Viet Minh assaults against French positions in central Dien Bien Phu, particularly at Eliani and Dominique, the two remaining outposts east of the Nam Yum River. Those two areas were held by five understrength battalions, composed of Frenchmen, Legionnaires, Vietnamese, North Africans, and Thais. Zop planned to use the tactics from the Beatrice and Gabriel skirmishes. At 1900 hours on 30 March, the Viet Minh 312th Division captured Dominique 1 and 2, making Dominique 3 the final outpost between the Viet Minh and the French General Headquarters, as well as outflanking all positions east of the river. At this point, the French 4th Colonial Artillery Regiment entered the fight, setting its 105mm howitzers to zero elevation and firing directly on the Viet Minh attackers, blasting huge holes in their ranks. Another group of French soldiers, near the airfield, opened fire on the Viet Minh with anti-aircraft machine guns, forcing the Viet Minh to retreat. The Viet Minh's simultaneous attacks elsewhere were more successful. The 316th Division captured Eliani 1 from its Moroccan defenders, and half of Eliani 2 by midnight. On the west side of Dien Bien Phu, the 308th attacked Huguet 7, and nearly succeeded in breaking through but a French sergeant took charge of the defenders and sealed the breach. Just after midnight on 31 March, the French launched a counter-attack against Eliani II, and recaptured it. Longley ordered another counter-attack the following afternoon against Dominique II and Eliani I, using virtually everybody left in the garrison who could be trusted to fight. The counter-attacks allowed the French to retake Dominique II and Eliani I, but the Viet Minh launched their own renewed assault. The French, who were exhausted and without reserves, fell back from both positions late in the afternoon. Reinforcements were sent north from Isabel, but were attacked en route and fell back to Isabel. Shortly after dark on 31 March, Longley told Major Marcel Bigard, who was leading the defense at Eliani II, to fall back from Eliani IV. Bigard refused, saying as long as I have one man alive I won't let go of Eliani for. Otherwise, Dean Bian Phu is done for. The night of the 31st of March, the 316th Division attacked Eliani too. Just as it appeared the French were about to be overrun, a few French tanks arrived from the central garrison, and helped push the Viet Minh back. Smaller attacks on Eliani four were also pushed back. The Viet Minh briefly captured Huguet 7, only to be pushed back by a French counterattack at dawn on 1 April. Fighting continued in this manner over the next several nights. The Viet Minh repeatedly attacked Eliani 2, only to be beaten back. Repeated attempts to reinforce the French garrison by parachute drops were made, but had to be carried out by lone planes at irregular times to avoid excessive casualties from Viet Minh anti aircraft fire. Some reinforcements did arrive, but not enough to replace French casualties. Chapter 3 Section 6, Trench Warfare On 5 April, after a long night of battle, French fighter bombers and artillery inflicted particularly devastating losses on one Viet Minh regiment, which was caught on open ground. At that point, Zop decided to change tactics. 
Although Zop still had the same objective, to overrun French defences east of the river, he decided to employ entrenchment and sapping to achieve it. On the 10th of April, the French attempted to retake Eliani 1, which had been lost 11 days earlier. The loss posed a significant threat to Eliani 4, and the French wanted to eliminate that threat. The dawn attack, which Bigir devised, began with a short, massive artillery barrage, followed by small unit infiltration attacks, then mopping up operations. Eliani 1 changed hands several times that day, but by the next morning the French had control of the strong point. The Viet Minh attempted to retake it on the evening of the 12th of April, but were pushed back. At this point, the morale of the Viet Minh soldiers was greatly lowered due to the massive casualties they had received from heavy French gunfire. During a period of stalemate from 15 April to the 1st of May, the French intercepted enemy radio messages which told of whole units refusing orders to attack, and Viet Minh prisoners in French hands said that they were told to advance or be shot by the officers and non commissioned officers behind them. Worse still, the Viet Minh lacked advanced medical treatment and care, with one captured fighter stating that, nothing strikes at combat morale like the knowledge that if wounded, the soldier will go uncared for. Concerned about a potential mutiny from his troops, Zop had to call for fresh reinforcements from neighboring Laos to bolster his dwindling and dispirited forces. During the fighting at Eliani 1, on the other side of camp, the Viet Minh entrenchments had almost entirely surrounded Huget 1 and 6. On the 11th of April the garrison of Huget 1, supported by artillery from Claudine, launched an attack with the goal of resupplying Huget 6 with water and ammunition. The attacks were repeated on the nights of the 14 to 15 and 16 to 17 April. While they did succeed in getting some supplies through, the French suffered heavy casualties, which convinced Longley to abandon Who Gets Six. Following a failed attempt to link up, on the 18th of April, the defenders at Who Gets Six made a daring breakout, but only a few managed to make it to French lines. The Viet Minh repeated the isolation and probing attacks against Who Get One, and overran the fort on the morning of the 22nd of April. After this key advance, the Viet Minh took control of more than 90% of the airfield, making accurate French parachute drops impossible. This caused the landing zone to become perilously small, and effectively choked off much needed supplies. A French attack against Huguet 1 later that day was repulsed. Chapter 3 Section 7, Isabel Isabel saw only light action until 30 March, when the Viet Minh isolated it and beat back the attempt to send reinforcements north. Following a massive artillery barrage on 30 March, the Viet Minh began employing the same trench warfare tactics that they were using against the central camp. By the end of April, Isabel had exhausted its water supply and was nearly out of ammunition. Chapter 3 Section 8 Final Attacks the Viet Minh launched a massed assault against the exhausted defenders on the night of the 1st of May, overrunning Eliani 1, Dominique 3, and Huguet 5, although the French managed to beat back attacks on Eliani 2. On the 6th of May, the Viet Minh launched another massed attack against Eliani 2, using, for the first time, Katusha rockets. The French artillery fired a top mission, so that artillery rounds fired from different positions would strike on target at the same time. This barrage defeated the first assault wave, but later that night the Viet Minh detonated a mine under Eliani II, with devastating effect. The Viet Minh attacked again, and within a few hours the defenders were overrun. On the 7th of May, Zop ordered an all-out attack against the remaining French units with over 25,000 Viet Minh against fewer than 3,000 garrison troops. At 1700 hours, de Castries radioed French headquarters in Hanoi and talked with Cogni. De Castries, the Viets are everywhere. The situation is very grave. The combat is confused and goes on all about. I feel the end is approaching, but we will fight to the finish. Cogni, of course you will fight to the end. It is out of the question to run up the white flag after your heroic resistance. 
The last radio transmission from the French headquarters reported that enemy troops were directly outside the headquarters bunker and that all the positions had been overrun. The radio operator in his last words stated, the enemy has overrun us. We are blowing up everything. Vive la France. That night the garrison made a breakout attempt, in the Cameron tradition. While some of the main body managed to break out, none succeeded in escaping the valley. At Isabel, a similar attempt later the same night saw about 70 troops, out of 1,700 men in the garrison, escape to Laos. By about 1820, only one French position, Strong Point Lily, manned by Moroccan soldiers commanded by a French officer, Major Jean Nicholas, had not been overrun. The position surrendered that night when Nicholas personally waved a small white flag from his rifle. Chapter 4, Aftermath Dean Bien Phu was a serious defeat for the French and was the decisive battle of the Indochina War. The garrison constituted roughly one-tenth of the total French Union manpower in Indochina, and the defeat seriously weakened the position and prestige of the French, it produced psychological repercussions both in the armed forces and in the political structure in France. This was apparent with the previously planned negotiations over the future of Indochina, which had just begun. Militarily there was no point in France fighting on, as the Viet Minh could repeat the strategy and tactics of the Dien Bien Phu campaign elsewhere, to which the French had no effective response. News of Dien Bien Phu's fall was announced in France several hours after the surrender, around 4.45 p.m., by Prime Minister Joseph Laniel. The Archbishop of Paris ordered a mass, while radio performances were cancelled and replaced by solemn music, notably Berlioz Requiem. Theatres and restaurants closed and many social engagements were cancelled, as a mark of respect. Public opinion in France registered shock that a guerrilla army had defeated a major European power. Within a month, the government of Laniel resigned, and the new Prime Minister, Pierre Mendez, formed a government with Communist Party support. Chapter 4, Section 1 Prisoners. On 8 May, the Viet Minh counted 11,721 prisoners, of whom 4,436 were wounded. This was the greatest number the Viet Minh had ever captured, amounting to one-third of the total captured during the entire war. The prisoners were divided into groups. Able-bodied soldiers were force-marched over 600 kilometers to prison camps to the north and east, where they were intermingled with Viet Minh soldiers to discourage French bombing runs. Hundreds died of disease along the way. The wounded were given basic first aid until the Red Cross arrived, extracted 858 prisoners, and provided better aid to the remainder. Those wounded who were not evacuated by the Red Cross were sent into detention. The Viet Minh captured 8,000 French and marched them 500 miles on foot to prison camps, fewer than half survived the march. Of 10,863 prisoners, only 3,290 were repatriated four months later, however, the losses figure may include the 3,013 prisoners of Vietnamese origin whose fate is unknown. Chapter 4 Section 2 – Casualties The Vietnamese government reported its casualties in the battle as 4,020 dead, 9,118 wounded, and 792 missing. The French estimated Viet Minh casualties at 8,000 dead and 15,000 wounded. Max Hastings stated that in 2018 Hanoi has still not credibly enumerated its Dien Bien Phu losses, surely a reflection of their immensity. Mark Moyer's book Triumph Forsaken lists Viet Minh casualties as 22,000, out of an original force of 50,000. Chapter 4 Section 3 – Political Ramifications The Geneva Conference opened on 8 May 1954, the day after the surrender of the garrison. The resulting agreement in July partitioned Vietnam into two zones, Communist North Vietnam and the State of Vietnam, which opposed the agreement, to the south. The partition was supposed to be temporary, and the two zones were meant to be reunited through national elections in 1956, which were never held. The last French forces withdrew from Vietnam in 1956. 
General George's Catru presided over a commission of inquiry into the defeat. The commission's final report concluded. The fall of Dean Bian Phu, in a strictly military perspective, represented a very serious failure but one that in the immediate, that is to say, spring of 1954, did not upset the balance of forces present in Indochina. It only assumed the aspect of a definitive defeat of our forces by reason of its profound psychological effects on French public opinion, which, tired of a war that was unpopular and seemingly without end, demanded in a way that it be ended. The event itself was in fact, both in terms of public opinion and of the military conduct of the war and operations, merely the end result of a long process of degradation of a faraway enterprise which, not having the assent of the nation, could not receive from the authorities the energetic impulse, and the size and continuity of efforts required for success. If, therefore, one wishes to establish objectively the responsibilities incurred in the final phase of the Indochina War one would have to examine its origins and evoke the acts and decisions of the various governments in power, that is to say their war policies, as well as the ways in which these policies were translated by the military commanders into operations. Chapter 4 Section 4 Women Many of the flights operated by the French Air Force to evacuate casualties had female flight nurses on board. A total of 15 women served on flights to Dean Bian Phu. One, Genevieve de Gallard, was stranded there when her plane was destroyed by shellfire while it was being repaired on the airfield. She remained on the ground providing medical services in the field hospital until the surrender. She was referred to as the Angel of Dean Bian Phu. Historians disagree regarding the moniker, with Martin Windrow maintaining that de Gallard was referred to by the name by the garrison itself, but Michael Kenny and Bernard Fall maintained it was added by outside press agencies. The French forces came to Dean Bian Phu accompanied by two Bordels Mobiles de Campania, served by Algerian and Vietnamese women. When the siege ended, the Viet Minh sent the surviving Vietnamese women for re education. Chapter 4, Section 5 U.S. Participation. Before the battle started both British and American missions visited Dean Bian Phu, to complete an assessment and left. The fall of Dean Bian Phu was a disaster not just for France but also for the United States who, by 1954, were underwriting 80% of French expenditures in Indochina. According to the Mutual Defense Assistance Act, the United States provided the French with material aid, during the battle aircraft, weapons, mechanics, 24 CIA-slash-CAT pilots, and U.S. Air Force maintenance crews. The United States, nevertheless intentionally avoided overt direct intervention. In February 1954, following the French occupation of Dean Bian Phu, Democratic Senator Michael Mansfield asked the United States Defense Secretary, Charles Irwin Wilson, whether the United States would send naval or air units if the French were subjected to greater pressure there, but Wilson replied that for the moment there is no justification for raising United States aid above its present level. On the 31st of March, following the fall of Beatrice, Gabrielle, and Anne-Marie, a panel of U.S. Senators and Representatives questioned the U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Arthur W. Radford, about the possibility of U.S. involvement. Radford concluded it was too late for the U.S. Air Force to save the French garrison. A proposal for direct intervention was unanimously voted down by the committee three days later, which concluded that intervention was a positive act of war. Both Eisenhower and the Secretary of State John Foster Dulles then pressed the British and other allies in a joint military operation. Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Foreign Secretary Antony Eden refused, but agreed on a collective security arrangement for the region which could be agreed at the Geneva Conference. For the Americans, in particular Dulles, this wasn't enough. Britain, already for some years involved in the Malayan emergency, was concerned at the American alarmism in the region, but was unaware of the scale of U.S. financial aid and covert involvement in the Indochina War. There were already suggestions at the time, notably from French author Jules Roy, that Admiral Radford had discussed with the French the possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons in support of the French garrison. Moreover, 
Dulles reportedly mentioned the possibility of lending atomic bombs to the French for use at Dien Bien Phu in April. Dulles tried to put more pressure on the British, and asked Eden for British support for American air action to save Dien Bien Phu. Eden refused, which enraged Dulles, however, Eisenhower relented. The president felt that, along with the political risks, airstrikes alone would not decide the battle, and did not want to escalate U.S. involvement by using American pilots. Nobody is more opposed to intervention than I am. The United States did covertly participate in the battle. Following a request for help from Henri Navarre, Radford provided two squadrons of B-26 Invader bomber aircraft and crew personnel to support the French. However not the Pentagon but the CIA managed the operation under the leadership of Secretary Dulles' brother Alan Dulles. Following this, 37 American transport pilots flew 682 sorties over the course of the battle. Earlier, in order to succeed the pre dean Bien Phu Operation Caster of November 1953, General Chester McCarthy made available 12 additional C-119 flying boxcars flown by French crews. In this period, a massive use of Philippines-based USAF B-29s against the Viet Minh heavy artillery, including the potential use of nuclear weapons, was planned by the US and French Joint Chief of Staff as Operation Vulture, but was cancelled by the respective governments. Two of the American pilots, James McGovern Jr., and Wallace Buford, were killed in action during the siege of Dien Bien Phu. On 25 February 2005, the seven still-living American pilots were awarded the French Legion of Honor by Jean David Levite, the French ambassador to the United States. The role that the American pilots played in this battle had remained little known until 2004. The U.S. historian Eric Kersinger researched the case for more than a year to establish the facts. Doc Dulles, on hearing of the news of the fall of the garrison, was furious, placing heavy blame on Eden for his inaction. Eden, however, doubted that intervention could have saved Dean Bian Fu, and felt it might have far-reaching consequences. Colonel William F. Long stated 12 years after the defeat. Dean Bian Phu or DBP has become an acronym or shorthand symbol for defeat of the West by the East, for the triumph of primitive. Dean Bian Phu resulted in severe political consequences. Chapter 5, Battlefield Today, the former battlefield is one large historical site. Former French fortified positions such as Beatrice, Gabriel, Eliani, the Bailey Bridge and De Castries headquarters bunker have been preserved, all in relatively good condition. Nearly 30 kilometers away from the center of Dien Bien Phu is the Viet Minh Army complex, containing shelters and trenches, which is also preserved in Muang Fang village. A 96-meter tunnel connects the working places of General Vo Win Zop and General Hoang Van Tai. In addition, monuments and memorials to both sides are situated across the region, as are the few remaining French chaffee tank wrecks scattered all throughout the valley, such as in the many rice paddy fields of the area. Also, the same runway used by the French during the battle remains to this day and is still in active use, but it is made of concrete. The pierced steel planking used by the French was taken up by villagers and used in construction of their homes and businesses. Chapter 6, In Popular Culture this battle was depicted in at least three films. Jump Into Hell, an American film directed by David Butler, shot in the US and released by Warner Brothers. Lost Command, stars Anthony Quinn as Lieutenant Colonel Pierre Raspi, and follows him from the final days of Dean Bian Phu to his final actions in the Algerian War. Dean Bian Phu, a docudrama film with autobiographical elements, made by Dean Bien Phu veteran and French director Pierre Schoendoeffer, in conjunction with the Vietnamese army. Other references include Doctor at Dean Bien Phu, 1955, Paul Henri Grauwin. Memory of Dean Bien, a war drama directed by Du Minh Tuan, about a Vietnamese and a French war veteran looking back at the battle. The last battle was depicted in 2011 Vietnamese first-person shooter video game 7554. 
The Redux edition of Apocalypse Now features a scene in which French plantation owners mention the Battle of Dien Bien Phu as a devastating event for the prospects of continued French occupation and blame communist revolutionaries in Paris for sabotaging the French war effort. Vai Bui Tuan Dung directed the 60-year anniversary commemorative TV series, Vai Duong Len Dien Bien. It was also mentioned in the Billy Joel song We Didn't Start the Fire. In the musical Miss Saigon, the character of the engineer introduces the number the American dream mentioning that it all changed with Dean Bian Fu. Chapter 7, Comparison with K. San In January 1968, during the Vietnam War, the North Vietnamese Army under Vo Win's Ops Command initiated a siege and artillery bombardment on the U.S. Marine Corps base at K. San in South Vietnam, as they did at Dien Bien Phu. The battle ended when the Americans withdrew, leading the North Vietnamese to declare victory. Zop's forces besieged Khe San for 77 days. Historians are divided on whether this was a genuine attempt to repeat their success at Dien Bien Phu by forcing the surrender of the Marine base, or else a diversion from the Tet Offensive, or an example of the North Vietnamese Army keeping its options open, or the other way around, the Tet Offensive itself a distraction from the offensive at Khe San. A number of factors were significantly different between Khe San and Dien Bien Phu. Khe San was much closer to a U.S. supply base compared to a French one at Dien Bien Phu. At Khe San, the U.S. Marines held the high ground, and their artillery forced the North Vietnamese to use their own artillery from a much greater distance. By contrast, at Dien Bien Phu, the French artillery was only sporadically effective. Furthermore, by 1968, the U.S. military presence in Vietnam dwarfed that of the French, and included numerous technological advances such as effective helicopters. Khe San received 18,000 tons of aerial resupplies during the 77-day battle, whereas during the 167 days that the French forces at Dien Bien Phu held out, they received only 4,000 tons. Also, the U.S. Air Force dropped 114,810 tons of bombs on the North Vietnamese at Khe San, roughly as many as on Japan in 1945 during World War II. Chapter 7 Section 1 Media Links Chapter 7 Section 1 Subsection 2 News Reels The News Magazine of the Screen U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles on the fall of Dean Bian Phu. Dean Bian Phu episode from 10,000 Day War Documentary on YouTube. Chapter 7 Section 1 Subsection 3 Retrospectives. English subtitled scene from the Dean Bian Phu docudrama by Schoenduffer. Archive footages of Colonel Sassi and his 2,000 strong Hmong partisans en route to Dien Bien Phu for a rescue mission in April 1954 on YouTube. Archive radio calls between General Cogni and Colonel de Castries plus two commented scenes from Schoenduffer's docudrama. Testimonial of General Zop, 50 years after the battle. Testimonial of General Big Eared, 50 years after the battle. Testimonial of Corporal Schoenduffer, 50 years after the battle. Chapter 7 Section 1 Subsection 4 War Reports The Battle of Dien Bien Phu